Ladies and gentlemen, our next two sessions focus on our second core topic of the ITB Convention 2018. The continuous increasing traffic cannot be managed with existing transportation systems. Gridlock seems to be unavoidable. Technological leaps are making entirely new transportation systems and seemingly revolutionary means of transport possible. What will the transportation system of the future look like? What role will Elon Musk's Hyperloop technology have in the future? Our next speaker is Dirk Alborn. Dirk Alborn is the CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies Incorporated, HTT, and the founder and CEO of Jumpstarter Incorporated. Founded in 2013, HTT designs and builds a highly profitable, fastest, safest, and environmentally friendly transportation system for passengers and goods. Hyperloop first gained public interest when entrepreneur Elon Musk published a white paper describing the futuristic mode of transport that would transport people from Los Angeles to San Francisco in about 30 minutes. Musk handed the concept to the public and Hyperloop transportation technologies rose to the challenge. Our moderator now, after the presentation of Dirk Alborn, is Christoph Schlautmann. Christoph Schlautmann studied in Münster in Germany and he has been working for the publishing group Handelsblatt, a famous German newspaper, since 1993. Recently as an editor for Handelsblatt, one of the leading business new newspapers in Germany, as I just mentioned. Before we start the presentation, we are interested to learn more about the audiences, about your opinion regarding revolutionary means of transport. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's now come to our live voting question. You see that you have remote control devices attached to your seats. Um, please press number one or two or three when I ask you the following questions. Do you think traveling via Hyperloop will soon become reality? If you think yes, please press 1. If you think no, please press 2. And if you think never heard of Hyperloop, then please press 3. Ladies and gentlemen, please vote now. So, we have a very optimistic audience, Dirk Alborn. Nearly half of them think, yes, it will be soon become reality. So now we are interested to hear more details about that reality. Mr. Alborn, please, the stage is yours. All right, good afternoon. My name is Dirk Alborn, as you just heard. I'm the CEO and founder of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. And, um, well, we say we are transforming transportation at the speed of sound. Speed of sound sounds amazing, doesn't it? But what's Hyperloop? Who actually thinks that they know what the Hyperloop really is? You raise your hands. Oh. I'll test you guys later. So for everybody else, there's a little video that um, explains maybe even a little bit how it started and um, gives you a little bit of background. So enjoy. I have a name for it, name for it which is called the Hyperloop. Imagine a capsule filled with people, right? You put this capsule inside the tube. You create a low-pressure environment inside the tube. So you have no resistance. And it's moving very fast from point A to point B. Capsule, very similar to an airplane that goes in high altitudes, uh, can travel really fast with very little energy. Is, is the main trick to it uh, the vacuum and the fact that there's no friction? Is that the, the main reason yeah. why it makes it so fast? Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop, and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. Company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. So when Elon published the document, he just drafted a possible way to achieve this. Two months later, my business partner, Dirk Alborn, took this document, published in our website, the Jumpstart Found, and did a call to action. So, how are we doing this? We want you all to join the Hyperloop movement. And we have been like overwhelmed of requests from 
engineers from all over the planet. Mm. Uh, there were people from, you know, NASA, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, yeah. Boeing, MIT. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. So we are creating the biggest crowdsourcing project in the planet. The company says it already has several potential investors and wants to take Hyperloop to China in the future. You have to consider that the Hyperloop is not a new idea. Um, humanity tried to build this system several times in the past. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods known as the Hyperloop is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5. We designed a system that is not only fast, but it can actually produce more energy than it consumes. It will change the way we live. It's possible today, it's based on existing technologies, and it's the right time, it's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. All right, so as I mentioned, these were basically a couple of uh, small clips put together out of the first couple of years. But to reiterate, what is a Hyperloop? So imagine a capsule filled with people or freight hovering inside a tube and moving really, really fast from one point to the other. Inside the tube, we create a low-pressure environment. So basically, we have vacuum pumps along the track that take all the air out, so that now the capsule can go much faster with much less energy, because it doesn't encounter any resistance. And it doesn't touch anywhere. It levitates. It levitates through a passive magnetic levitation technology, which is different from what you might know as the maglev, right? the trans rapid in Germany a lot of the times is very expensive. Our technology is actually much safer and much cheaper. Here's a little bit how it works. Using magnets to move and elevate trains is not a new thing. But this method hasn't been efficient enough to make sense on a large scale. The primary reason, simple. A vast amount of energy is required to power the system. 20 years ago, a team of engineers from Lawrence Livermore Labs began the work that would solve those problems. For more than two decades, they've researched a full-scale functioning prototype. And in that time, they discovered how to arrange magnets over an aluminum track in such a way that the track uses almost no power, making it much more efficient. At Hyperloop, we've picked up where they left off, adapting that revolutionary system for commercial use. There are several ways in which our system, using passive magnetic levitation, is safer and more efficient than maglev technology currently in use. Let's start with efficiency. Regenerative braking during deceleration recovers much of the energy used for acceleration. Power stations are not required along our track, making our system more affordable to build than previous levitation systems. Let's talk about safety. Only when the pod slows and returns to a safe speed will it gently touch down on the track once again. A comfortable, natural occurrence with our magnetic levitation system. At a slow, comfortable speed, the capsule rises up from the track. This levitation remains steady and constant through the duration of the journey. We find the smartest technologies and look for ways to improve them. You'll find this approach repeated over and over within every aspect of HTT innovation. The system is completely green. It uses alternative energy, solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and, uh, well, in an ideal case, depending on the route, of course, we produce more energy than we're using. This is a very important part, not because we want to be green, but actually because, well, you know, when we looked at this, we found out that there's no railway, no metro in the whole world that's profitable. They're all relying heavily on government subsidies. So. Here, because we're using very little energy, because it's automized, we have very low operational cost, and in addition to that, we produce our own energy, we can even be profitable in a very short time span. So most of the studies that we have done show a return of investment somewhere between eight to 12 years, which is really amazing. But why? Why should we care about what we call the fifth mode of transportation? This is why. Traffic. 
right? Traffic is one of the biggest problems that we have. We spend a lot of time in traffic. Time that we could be productive, time that we could be with the people we care about. Actually, traffic is so important that based on where you live, you decide where you work. Think about that. And well, in Los Angeles, where I live, you even decide who you date, because if she lives on the other side of the city, it's probably not going to work out. And then we have this, Beijing on a sunny day. On a bad day, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. So now most people believe that this is a problem that you really have in China or in India, but in real, it's a problem that we have everywhere. Even here in Central Europe, you're losing 15 months of your life thanks to pollution. Now, of course, transportation is only a part of that, but it's important enough that politicians all around the world now are moving forward and are creating laws to, to move transportation over to green alternatives. Well, then we have the railway industries. They're literally what we call a dinosaur industry. They haven't changed much, if you really think about it. They're still basically the same like 200 years ago, right? So these are normal railroad tracks. This is how we're building them today. The distance between those tracks is 1 meter 43.5. Anybody here knows why? It's that specific distance. <laughs> yeah, the Roman carriage, right? So just think about that. Let it sink in for a moment. In 2018, we're building new infrastructure based on the butts of two horses, right? That's how much innovation we have done there. Amazing. And then, as I already mentioned, cost. So this is an example from the Los Angeles Metro where they're making 76 cents per passenger and $2.50 for each passenger actually coming from taxpayer money. Now, of course, you can say, well, it's Los Angeles, everybody is taking the car, that's why you're all standing in traffic, and yeah, there might be some truth to it. But even New York, which is one of the most used metros in the world, loses $2.2 billion every single year. Germany subsidizes their net rail network with roughly 22 billion euros every single year. And that's really like that all over the world. But how would our lives change if we had a Hyperloop? Well, actually another problem are airports, right? They're overflowing. We're building more and more of them. They're fairly close to the city. With the Hyperloop, we could connect these airports and can, could make them become terminals, actually. So imagine, right, whenever BER is finished, connected to Tegel, and it's actually just, you know, another terminal. You're there within minutes. Or you can build them much further out and still be there within just a couple of minutes. When it comes to freight, we're able to connect Asia to Europe within hours rather than within weeks. You know, and those ships that are moving the containers, they're not that great for the environment either. We could be enabling literally an on-demand economy. But most people really get excited about living wherever you want. Live in one place and work in another. Think about satellite cities. Cities are overflowing. Everybody wants to be in the center. Now, with a Hyperloop, we are able to build cities much further out, connect them and be in the city center in just 10 minutes. If you want to have a house with, you know, like in where I live, and you don't want to risk to get shot in the front yard, you have to spend at least a million dollars. Here, it would be much cheaper, and just with the difference in the real estate value, you would actually finance the system. But how are we going to do this? Well, so when we looked at the visibility of the system, it turns out the technology already exists. It's used in a lot of different areas. 
We know how to do this. We know how to levitate a train. We know how to move a train. We know how to build pylons and tubes. We know how to create a vacuum inside a tube. Actually, this is a picture of the CERN Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And the pressures inside those tubes, the vacuum inside those tubes, is 100,000 times more difficult to maintain than the one that we need. And the company responsible for that vacuum is actually part of our team, Libot Vacuum. Alternative energy is basically a safe bet. It's very similar to the silicon chip. It gets better and better and cheaper and cheaper every single year. So today, in California, with the latest solar technology, we are capable of covering our complete energy costs. And tomorrow, that's going to be even cheaper and better. But we're doing something else in a completely different way. We're building a company in a completely different way. And that's one of the reasons why you probably have at least heard about the Hyperloop, right? Because when you talk about a train or a metro, this is where it's happening, behind closed doors. Maybe you hear that they're planning something. Maybe you hear how much it's going to cost. But um, that's kind of it. We do something that we call crowdstorming. So we actually work with our community. We work with you. So basically, what this means is we ask questions. So we have the unique opportunity to build a transportation system the way you would do in 2018. And, well, that means that you question everything, just like if it would never have existed. How would you build a transportation system today? That's a question. I mean, every one of us takes a bus, a train, uh, an airplane, right? When you do the boarding, for example, you know that, th that those things can be done better because you have the technology in your pocket. You know that if we use existing technology and innovation, we can build a much better system. So we ask questions like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket the right way to make money? Think about it. 200 years ago, a guy said, hey, it's a train. Let's charge tickets. But today, is it still the best business model? If you think about all the time that you spent inside transportation, inside your car, inside a plane, I was just on a plane for 14 hours, and nobody tried to entertain me while making money. Right? I mean, I think we all agree that travel sucks. Right? You like to get to the destination, but you don't like to actually travel, do the act. But we can do better. We're spending billions of dollars to get people to places that they can spend their money. And in transportation, they're already there. So if we see transportation as a marketing, and we monetize on the time that the passenger spends inside the vehicle, everything changes. But it's all about building a better system, creating a better passenger experience while making money. One of these examples is our virtual windows, for example. So we have a problem. We don't have windows. So we're using normal screens and um, cameras, and we do head tracking. So we move the image based on where you're looking to simulate a window. And now this actually gives the opportunity for you not to see what's outside, but maybe you go through Terminator Land, Jurassic Park, Game of Thrones. You know, it's, for you it's an experience, but for the transportation company, it's actually a way of generating income. And that's just one of the many examples where you can use technology that exists today to come up with completely new models, creating you know, a new kind of content. Think about it, between subway stations, now you're actually you know, going through Jumanji, just as one of the examples. All right, but why? Why are we working this way? 
So when Elon Musk proposed this idea in 2013, I was part of a nonprofit incubator that was funded by NASA. And we were working on a new way of how to build companies. You see, you do everything online today, right? You get your groceries online, you get your dry cleaning online, you can find your boyfriend, girlfriend online. In America, you can even get divorced online. But when it comes to building a business, it's you as a friend sitting somewhere in a bar, talking about this big problem you want to solve. And well, many times, six months later, you find out that nobody else really had that problem. Or maybe you, don't, you couldn't find out how to make money. Most companies actually fail for lack of insight, lack of experience. But if you would have 10, 100, 1,000 people that are as passionate as you are about your project, that give you their honest opinion, your, their ideas, their contacts, you can build a better company. So we built this platform, and when Elon Musk said that he didn't want to do the Hyperloop because he was too busy with Tesla and SpaceX, but he wanted someone else to pick it up, we reached out, asked for permission to put it onto the platform, and asked our community, should we be doing this? And not only did they say, yes, you should be doing this, but they actually said, hey, I want to be part of this. So we incorporated the company, got a small team together, and said, everybody who would like to join and work in exchange for stock options in the company, please apply. We got around 100 applications, got a team together, sorry, 200 applications, got a team together of around 100 engineers, and started working on the feasibility study. The feasibility study was finished at the end of 2014. So that's when we knew, OK, this actually can be done. And it makes sense to do it. And today, we're over 800 people all around the world, in addition to over 47 companies, most of them working for a participation in the company. And we have thousands of people in our community that we crowdstorm with. So the Hyperloop is not a new idea. It has been around for actually quite some time, hundreds of years. People have tried this, and they failed. But they failed because it was always depending on one company, one government. So we realized we had to do more than just build a company. We had to build a movement. And that's exactly, exactly what it is today. There are several companies many universities all around the world working on the SpaceX competition. You hear about Hyperloop all the time. It's a movement. Actually, now it's becoming an industry. We're a global company, but we're also local. So we're kind of global, right? We have offices in Los Angeles, in Barcelona, in Slovakia, in the Emirates, and we're opening up our R&D center in Toulouse. Some of the companies that are working with us are literally leaders in their fields. Atkins, construction engineering, it's one of the largest engineering firms in the world. They are the ones that did the Dubai Metro, just to give you guys an idea. Kaburis is a supplier for Airbus and Boeing. They do the fuselages for the airplane. Leibold Vacuum, mentioned them earlier. They are the inventor of the vacuum pump several hundred years ago and many, many more. Right, so, but when? When are we going to see the Hyperloop? So for the last five years, we have been very busy. We've been working on technology, integrating it, licensing, creating patents, doing deals, and, well, we are ready to build. So version number one is ready. There's going to be a version 212 one day, no question. But um, the first one is ready to be done. Actually, we started. We started manufacturing the, the world's first passenger Hyperloop capsule with our partner Caburis in Spain. The capsule will be manufactured and will be ready, actually, we started last year. It will be ready, I think, around June, July and then go to Toulouse in order to be assembled and integrated. All right, so now I've been telling you the whole time that this is all so easy and, um, you know, it's just like, hurry up, just build it. But there is actually a problem. There's a big problem. You see, there's never been a Hyperloop. And it's not a train. It's not an airplane. 
So you need a completely new set of rules, regulations. And this means working with politicians. And whoever of you has ever worked with politicians knows that that's not that easy. But um, oops, I just saw that my team wrote Bratislava wrong. But anyways, um, so you know, by, move, by working in a way that we do as a movement, we actually have those politicians working with us. They're there. They're, you know, part of our movement. So I've met some of the world leaders and sat down with them, and they actually, they want to solve this problem as well. They need to solve it today. So we are working in a lot of different countries. In the Czech Republic, we're doing a feasibility study between Bratislava, Brno, and Prague. In Slovakia, we're looking into a local system in Bratislava. In America, we have an area where we filed our building permits and are doing now the environmental studies. In um, Indonesia, Jakarta, one of the worst traffic areas of the world, we're doing a feasibility study. In Toulouse, the French government gave us a building in an outside area to do an R&D center. In Abu Dhabi, we finished already the world's first complete Hyperloop feasibility study together with the government. And um, Sheikh Falah bin Zayed Al Nayan, the brother of the ruler of the Emirates, is our official sponsor in the Emirates. So you see, you always need like a local person, and I guess we have the best one. South Korea decided they are going to build a Hyperloop and created a consortium. And we're working with this consortium to license the technology. You see, all of these are the first steps to now look into the system, answer the questions, and start working on what's the most important thing, the regulations. We're working with TÜV, TUV, German company, safe for the safety standards. And Munich Re, or Münchner Rück, the world's largest reinsurance company of the world, just published a risk report saying that they're able to insure our system. So these are the important steps to move forward with commercialization of the system. We announced a feasibility study Dreams in America. Come That's easy. the last video, and then I gave, of get off your travel, stage. Cloning woolly mammoths and colonizing Pluto. Dreams where we zip across the country in tubes at 700 miles an hour, powered by sunlight and magnets. Five years ago, it was literally just a dream. The problem is, when the time comes for all those dreams to get made, the dreamers don't know where to go. To build dreams, you go to cities unafraid of work and people known for making things. Big things like aviation and smaller things like tanks. The kind of talent that we have at our disposal here is amazing. I have been in transportation and infrastructure for over 30 years. I've been 17 years as a scientist and an executive at NASA. I'm the chairman of the industry-based led Aerospace and Aviation Council. I attended Yale University and started a career in aerospace uh, at McDonnell Douglas. Where do you go to make dreams, to build them? with metal and glass in your own two hands. You go to cities like Cleveland and Chicago, Pittsburgh and Detroit, places that have had dreams and then made them. We absolutely have the manufacturing. We have the raw materials. We do it cost effectively. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of work ethic uh, and, and really, really strong resources. The Midwest is a place that drops a welding mask over its face and gets to work. And that's why we can't wait to build America's first Hyperloop here. It is quite amazing to see how many partners Hyperloop Transportation Technology already has with academic institutions, with government institutions, with the private sector. Flying 700 miles an hour through a tube using magnets and sunlight isn't a dream. It's a we're building this and coming to the Midwest to do it thing. We've already got a prototype thing. Millions in funding to survey it thing. First stop, Cleveland to Chicago in under 30 minutes. Connecting the makers of muscle and metal and rock and brick and mortar of this country. You're going to see 
Hyperloop transition from what is in the past been perhaps a dream of how fast we can go, how can we send people more quickly to different places, it will eventually become a utility. This is something people will talk about for generations. When your grandkids are uh, telling you about this, this new cool Hyperloop train they got to be on, you can say, you know, I was there when they just started. So let's get to work. This thing can't wait any longer. All right, I guess you guys want me to answer some questions, right? So um, I got a little bit confused by the, by the time, but thank you. Thank you. So I'm very happy that I belong to the people that already heard of it. Uh, I remember maybe a half a year ago there was a bunch of students that were presenting a Hyperloop model in front of Deutsche Post DHL in Bonn. Uh, they be, uh, belong to a team of uh, the University of Den Haag, uh, The Hague. Delft, probably. Delft, Delft it was, right. And um, I think they won the uh, uh, a competition uh, from uh, Elon Musk. I so think it depends the, who you ask, but uh, <laughs> yeah. so there the, was a, the guys from Munich from would Munich say too. that they won it. But, but I think the, the Dutch people were the, the fastest one, I, I think. So it was very interesting for me, but there are, uh, uh, of course, some questions left. The first of all, uh, what do you estimate yourself? Uh, um, will it be probable, probable uh, to build this uh, Hyperloop within the next maybe 10, 15 years? Yeah, of course, definitely. I mean, um, so we're expecting to announce the first commercial line over the next six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, it should roughly take three years for construction. Um, the, the issues are more regulatory. So three years until you and me can mm -hmm. go really? take a ride. Mm -hmm. There's actually going to be a lot more uh, news coming up later this year. Um, so stay tuned. But um, yeah, so once it's built, you know, then it's going to still take quite some time until you want to start a little bit slower and then, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, that's just the time it takes. But building it and demonstrating that you can run it and that it makes mostly economical sense because that's a real problem that we're having in the world, um, you know. That's something that's going to happen fairly fast. For me, it is quite astonishing. Uh, once I, I drove to, from uh, Los Angeles to uh, San Francisco, and I think it's about 500 kilometers, correct me. Yeah. So uh, is it really possible to build a vacu vacuum pipe on, uh, with that long distance? What is, what is, well, is it's not much different than, than building pipelines, right? And pipelines have been but built. But it's high pressure or anti-pressure. Well, I mean, <laughs> gas lines are fairly mm. high pressure as well. So, mm. you know, it's... Uh, Again, uh, <laughs> I'm astounded by all the things that we do all day, uh, all, all day, every day, and all the technologies that we have in our pockets. That's actually fairly simple. Okay. So you have vacuum pumps along the track. Huh? Um, the system moves, of course, but all these technologies are already there to compensate. And it doesn't, I mean, you know, you have those pumps that are, that are basically making sure that you maintain the pressure. Of course, the pressure varies a little bit, mm -hmm. so you okay. always have, you don't have a constant one. Mm -hmm. And it's not a complete vacuum. That's what people don't really understand. Mm -hmm. It's a very low pressure. So it's comparable with going roughly 30 kilometers above the ground, right above sea level. But it's not a complete vacuum. And um, a complete vacuum is very difficult. But uh, a low pressure, you know, okay, is, okay. is much easier. What will happen if there's an earthquake? So it's a, this, uh, that region, there's a San Andreas fault. I think it's, it's uh, rather common that there's maybe, so, maybe the, the pipe is damaged. What will happen to the capsule in, at that moment? So when it's, um, I mean, if you're right at the moment of the earthquake above the fault, there's probably not much you can do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's like everything else if you're right there. Um, the system is still much safer than anything else. So a train that's on the ground, for example, can compensate. We are on a structure. So you're on pylons. You can compensate for the Earth movement. Um, pipelines have been surviving earthquakes that are 8.0 for quite some time, actually since the 70s. Mm -hmm. So you know we have technology to compensate the Earth movement. It's I don't want to say it's, a, it's not a problem, but it's something that you can you know, account for. And um, it's actually one of the advantages of the system. OK. So in your presentation, you said there uh, you can think about um, uh, commuter pipes, so from, the, from one airport into the city and back on whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
I always thought it's um, going by the speed of more than 100, uh, 1,000 kilometers per hour. So is it useful to, to drive this capsule with, with that short distances? I mean, yeah, my car can drive 200 kilometers an hour, but most of the time I don't, right? So it's, speed is something that uh, is a result of all the different elements that the system has. So I can go right below the speed of sound. Um, as soon as I go to the speed of sound, things get much more complicated. Mm -hmm. But in order to go that fast, I have to go very straight. The real advantage is actually that it makes economic sense. So I'm moving inside a low-pressure environment. I'm using much less energy. The whole system costs much less. Mm -hmm. It's much more compact. So you know, in that case, yes, it makes sense on shorter distances you don't get up to the full speed. Depending on the route, you might go up to, I don't know, three, four, five hundred kilometers an hour, still amazing. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's really like, it might make economic sense. And that's, okay, you know. Okay. Uh, what will the ticket uh, cost at the end? Well, you heard me saying earlier a little bit that I actually believe, or if it's after me, it would be free. And free because, um, I believe there's different ways on how we can monetize. So I think that the travel experience in general is not the one that we want. I don't see it going anywhere. I mean, I'm um, 195, I have to think now because in centimeters, <laughs> but um, so I, there's so many airlines, I don't fit an economy anymore. It's impossible for me mm. to sit. And it's getting, you know, maybe I need to get on a diet, but it's getting narrower and narrower as well. So it's, it's really, really difficult to travel. And it's not an, ex I mean, you're, you're kind of getting treated like cattle, right? Okay. It's, uh, it's not really an experience. We can do things much better and we can monetize. If you think about it, the only thing that's trying to monetize on your commute right now, when you sit in your car, is your car radio. Right? That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. And that's going to fall away once you have self-driving cars. But Inside a plane, inside a train, there's really nothing that tries to make a good use of your time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of smart people. So by building an ecosystem, right, so, and that's what we do. We create a basis where then other people like all of you can build on top of. You actually can come up with new solutions, new services that make your travel experience nicer, that um, you know, maybe lets you do things that normally you would do when you get home. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's other ways on how you can generate income. Uh, for me, it was very interesting to see. It's like a brave new world. So with the windows, <laughs> uh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, but how many people will fit into one capsule? So it depends. Um, the standard ones are roughly 30 to 40 people. It's a 30 meter long capsule. That depends a little bit how the seating is done. Uh, we're working with several design firms right now on not so much on the seats, but really on the experience, like what do you do inside there. Uh, on a local system that doesn't go up to speed that much, you can actually you know, fit much more people because mm. it's much more similar than to a subway okay. maybe. Okay. And what is your target group? Is that, uh, so if, if, if there is no, no cost, no prices for the tickets, so it's for everyone? Or? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, uh, that's what it should be, right? <laughs> it's mass transportation. It's uh, for the masses. It's not only for but the business people that... Uh, no, I actually, I actually believe it's uh, the future of travel is not classes. The future of travel is based on what you want to do, right? Mm. So if I want to call a car and I feel like a massage, I might call a massage car, right? Or the same inside the Hyperloop. If I'm on a date, I might you know, I might use a date department, right? So a little bit, something a little bit more romantic, or if I'm on a business trip, maybe there are tools that help me have more efficient meetings. Mm -hmm. So first class, second class, economy, that doesn't really make sense. It's mm -hmm. more about the experience, what you want to do, what you want to achieve while you're traveling. Based on that, you might be willing to spend a little bit more, spend less. And uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of services that you can offer. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, so, um, do we uh, need airplanes any, any longer if, you, if we have this? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, yes. No. So, we, how, we... How are, so, my question is, how, how are, you, are you connecting the, the Hyperloop with other um, 
uh, tr transport devices and, and systems. So very much. Um, actually, <coughs> as you as you might have understood, <coughs> we are looking. So for us, it's not only moving a capsule inside a tube. <coughs> it's uh, we're technology company, so we are building technologies in um, in the mobility space, and it's about for us. It starts with a passenger at home, right? And uh, so it's important also to figure out the first and last mile issues. How do you get to the station? How long is it going to take you? Because if I can get you from here to, let's say, Amsterdam in 30 minutes, but it takes you an hour and a half to get to the station, I haven't really changed your life. And um, so it needs to work with the existing modes of transportation. We have actually worked and talked with many of the airlines. Um, and they are very supportive, also because, again, it's not our goal to build Hyperloops all around the world. We build the technology and then give it to the transportation companies uh, and license it. But um, yeah, so you know, you're still going to need. Uh, so there was actually some analysis done from some of the airlines mm -hmm. that looked into the different routes. And for certain short distance doesn't make sense, of course. It, those going to fall away. But mm -hmm. long distance still makes a lot of sense. You know, when you talk about um, everything that's, I would say, more than 1,500 kilometers, you know, un until you have a network, um, it definitely makes a lot of sense to have an airplane, mm -hmm. especially now that they're moving to become supersonic again, okay. right? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do we hear a boom if they uh, cross the supersonic uh, border? The airplanes? Like airplanes? Like no, no, we don't. We so we stay right below the sound barrier. But uh, if the the capsule um, moves in the, uh, more more than supersonic speed, so do the the. I mean, the if people that happens, around that we're, uh, if that happens, they are probably in trouble. There's a lot of things that uh, that change the moment that you reach, you know, supersonic speed, super fluids. So um, that's why it's just below you the can, sound barrier. OK, it's, it's just below uh, supersonic. So otherwise, you, you cannot avoid this. So Well, I mean, there's a, it becomes just, I would say, 500 times more complicated to do this. <laughs> okay. right? Because you have to figure out what happens to the structure. You have to figure out. I mean, okay. there's just a lot of uh, it, it, it going from 200 kilometers to 600, 700 kilometers inside the low pressure environment. Beside, when, especially when it's very straight, is not so much a difference. But so passing a sound barrier changes a lot of things. Okay, okay. So uh, I heard that you were approved. Your system was approved by Munich Re, by the insurance company. Is this a kind of uh, tailwind for you now? So, or well, so we have been working with them for quite some time. We continue working with them. They've looked at the system. They, um, they, they said they're able to insure it, which is mm -hmm. very important. Because you know, if you want to sell it, you need to be able to you know, say here, it's safe. And there is someone who pays if, it's, if, if anything would happen. right? Um, so it's a very important step for commercialization of the system. So in order to, to sell the first couple, um, it's absolutely necessary that together with the license, maybe we also give the insurance. Mm, okay. There are some other guys that are trying to build a Hyperloop themselves, like uh, Richard Branson or uh, Ben Brogan. Uh, are these kind of rivals for you, or are these partners maybe? So, as I, as I explained earlier, we were the first company actually out there. Mm. We started in 2013, and then um, the others joined. Um, it's, it's really from the beginning as well actually thought like this. You don't want to be the only one. You need to have competition. Um, it, it's, I mean, for the general public, it doesn't really matter. They're all just like, just built this thing. And um, for us, it's the same. I mean, personally, I believe that we should celebrate our, all of our achievements. Um, however, you know, there's, I think a lot of differences in the companies. We, in general, see ourselves a little bit like the, you know, the one that's embracing them all. And mm -hmm. if they develop a better propulsion system or levitation system than we do, well, we're happy to use it as well. So it's not the market is big enough. It's a completely new industry that's um, that's mm -hmm. being born, and uh, it it takes a lot of bright people to come up with something. Our model helps us to partner with these. Um, in their cases, a lot of the times there are a lot of ego involved, and they don't want to. But uh, you know that might change in the future. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of difference in the vision, right? So what you've heard earlier, I think we're 
trying to think everything through and um, really make sure that we build something that changes the world the way that we expect it and probably you guys expect it as well. Okay, so my last question is what is in your view the, the, the biggest obstacle, maybe a regulatory obstacle uh, for, for the Hyperloop? <laughs> well, you know, you, you already said it. It's, innovation can go really fast. Politicians are not that fast, right? So it's, it just really takes um, the willingness of uh, the politics to push this forward. And, um, you know, certain countries are a little bit more difficult. Europe definitely is much more difficult. Uh, America has the worst um, um, right of way laws in the world, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of other countries and um, you know, I've met with Putin several times, I've met with Erdogan, I've met with Merkel, Macron, you name it, uh, the different kings and probably most of the ministers of transportation in the world and uh, luckily, you know, they, it, it is an issue, it's a problem. If, as I mentioned earlier, Germany alone spends over 22 billion euros every year. If we can, let's just say, reduce it of 10%, Now that's two billion that you can spend somewhere else, maybe mm -hmm. in education, right? So <laughs> it's important. Okay, Dick, thank you very much. Thank you. I think in the end we have got um, another live voting. So maybe we can show it. Over there. So, All right, thank you. It's, it's, thank you very much. So, So maybe uh, you already know the question. We, uh, we posted the, at the beginning of the session too. And uh, maybe you can um, vote once again. Uh, do you think that traveling via Hyperloop will soon become reality? Yes or no? So please press your button within the Ah, th thank you very much. I think uh, it was a very uh, interesting uh, <laughs> session and many of you are now convinced that it will become in the future. So thank you very much for your vote.